this is one of those passages that is tremendously misunderstood. <laughs> and so I want us to take that to task and deal with it. The, um, you know, the guiding principle remains what it has been throughout the entire series on Romans. This passage, like all the other ones, is about Jew and Gentile. This particular passage is about the choice uh, of a specific line of persons, a specific nation through whom the word of God comes. And, well, that's pretty much it. But Paul's wishing that uh, people would obey the gospel from among the Jews in the first century. So that's a reasonable wish, and it's fine. But um, the big picture here in 9 and in 10 is that they're not doing so because they're hampered by their way of reading the Scripture, uh, you know, the Law of Moses. And they're not willing to submit to that in some cases. Not every case, obviously. Paul is one who has obeyed, and there are some at Rome who have obeyed. But that's what he's talking about. And when he talks about the uh, the choice of individuals through whom the lineage is reckoned and the choice of nations who would be saved or uh, nations who would be destroyed, he's talking about the fact that God has made um, choices in human history to bring about what he wanted to bring about. He's talking about how Israel came to be what Israel is and why it's important in the time in which he's writing. And all of it is pointing at, again, the, that they should be saved. They are the people of God. It's a real shame that they are not, there's not more of them obeying than there were at the time this was written. That's what he's saying in the big picture. Um, along the way, uh, he's also, of course, noting that, you know, there are uh, there are choices that God has made that are about history and about um, nations and peoples, places in the world and in history that are entirely his choices, and they're up to him. Where the problem comes in, I think, is people read these and think that Paul is talking about salvation, about whether people go to heaven. And so if what we're really saying is that God has chosen a specific uh, heir in, say, Isaac, as the one through whom the lineage would come, and that that became the chosen uh, race, if you will, that became the chosen country, and if we say that Israel being chosen means that Egypt is also chosen, but Egypt is chosen as the foil against Israel, they're going to lose in the eventual battle between them when Israel leaves Egypt. Right? If we're reading that history, which is what it actually says, as though he's talking about salvation, then we have a very serious problem because we've just turned God into a monster who has already decided before anybody was born that only the descendants of Jacob or of uh, Isaac will be saved. Only Israel will be saved. He raised up the whole nation of Egypt just to send them all to hell in glory over them. No, that's not true at all. That is what people believe, though. Make no mistake about it. People believe that that's what this passage is saying. But that's completely wrong. It, it's not saying any such thing. It's not touching on their salvation at all. It's talking about their place in history, their place in how we how things came to be the way that they were in the first century. Not about whether these individuals had been saved. Okay, so that's the big picture. When you get down to it, you know, in chapter 9, it's, uh, you know, verses 1 through 5, he said, I'm speaking the truth. Not lying, my conscience bears me witness. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites. So Paul 
says he has great anguish over the fact that the Israelites, as a rule, are not obeying the gospel, and they should. That's all this means. <laughs> okay, but verse 6, it's not as though the word of God has failed. Not all are descended, or not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are children of Abraham just because there is offspring. But rather, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So, if we back up for a minute here to the sixth verse. It's not as though the word of God has failed, first of all. So the word has come, and the word has said how that salvation would come through Israel, and how the world would be blessed through Abraham. The word of God hasn't failed, just because people have failed to obey. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And so I'd refer you back to chapter 3 of Romans, uh, where Paul was very plain about this in verses 3 and 4. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithful or the, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. That's Romans three three to four. So first of all, it's not as though the word of God has failed. The word of God has accomplished what its purposes are, and as he said earlier in Romans three, even if the people in some cases, proved to be unfaithful. That doesn't tarnish God's reputation. And it's not God's fault that that happened. He is justified in his words. He prevails when he is judged. Let God be true, though every one were a liar. Now, he's not saying they're all liars. He's saying even if it were true that every Israelite in ancient Israel was a liar, God would still be true. It doesn't reflect on him. His word has done what it was sent to do. And then you have Romans 2 earlier, where he said plainly, not, you know, when we read in Romans 9, 6, not all who are de descended from Israel belong to Israel. That's a rehash of Romans 2, 28 to 29. No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. A Jew is one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. So it's not just being physically descended from Abraham, physically descended from Israel. The word of God hasn't failed. Not everybody descended from Israel belongs to Israel. Who belongs? As he said, it's not merely an outward thing. It's in the heart, by the Spirit. And that's what leads you to Romans 9, 7, 8, and 9. Not all are children of Abraham because there is offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means, Romans 9, 8, it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. This is what the promise had said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. The children of the promise are the children of that promise that was made to Sarah. I'm coming back next year and you will have a son. Or promise, uh, he said this to Abraham actually about Sarah's going to have a son at this time next year. That was a promise. The children of the promise, not the children of the flesh. What do we mean by that? Well, you may recall that Sarah had been barren, and at that time she gave Hagar, the Egyptian slave, to Abraham so that he could have a child through her, which he did. Um, that's Ishmael, and he becomes, you know, the father of many nations as well. I believe, I might be wrong, but I believe that Ishmael is the father of the modern Middle East, of, uh, of the, uh, the Arabs and the 12 princes of the East. Um, so they're certainly blessed through the blessings of Abraham in the flesh. But this is the promise through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Well, what do we mean by this? If you go back to Genesis 21, we're going to read here. So, you know, go ahead and pull out Genesis 21. 
But if you go back to where this was done, you know, the verses being quoted are being quoted on purpose, and there's a bigger story there that needs to be seen. You've got to understand the arc of what is what Paul is putting forth for us. And Genesis 21 is the place where it's recorded. Verses 1 to 3, the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. As we mentioned earlier, Abraham called the name of the son born to him whom Sarah born, or bore him, Isaac. Not Hagar's son, Sarah's son, the miraculous son, born when he was something like 100 years old, and Sarah 90-something years old, and she had been bearing her whole life up until that point, too. This is miraculous. That's the son of promise, not the son of the flesh, meaning the way that children normally come, the way that Hagar conceived a child. Well, later on, you read in the eighth verse of Genesis 21, the child grew and was weaned, that's Isaac. And Abraham made a great feast the day that Isaac was weaned. Which is a thing. Um, in Japan, they celebrate the first birthday more than the birth. We celebrate the birth of the child. In Japan, they celebrate the first birthday. That's the big, the big shindig where everybody comes around and uh, leaves their places and comes to your house to celebrate your child. Uh, in this culture, they did this at weaning, which could have been by year one, but it could be very late. Some places in Africa, it's as late as three years. And I'll let you think about that if you want to. But uh, this is to say, he now is going to be, you know, this is legit. This is, this is going to continue. This one is not going to die in infancy or be lost to illness, basically. So the child is weaned. The great feast is happening. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son. But the son of the slave woman should not be heir with my son, Isaac. Okay. And, you know, why is she saying it? It doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is the pattern. Now the woman who is the one who received a promise from God that was fulfilled, who has born a child miraculously, says, we're going to cast out the fleshly woman who is not really your wife, whose child came in the normal way, not the miraculous way. He will not be an heir with my son. The thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. Ishmael is what it means. But God said to Abraham, don't be displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So first of all, God has chosen to do the reckoning of the lineage through Isaac. Not through Ishmael. First. Second, I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. So the blessings, the earthly blessings pronounced on Abraham do accord to the earthly offspring of Abraham. As we said before, the sons of the East have been greatly blessed. And that is due to the origin in Abraham. Okay, so Ishmael, that's fine. I'm good with all of that. I think the Bible is very clear about this. So we wrap this up. We go back into Romans 9. Remember what he said. They're not all children of Abraham because there's offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. It's not all the children of the flesh who are the children of God. It's the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. What's the promise? The promise was about this time next year, I'll return. Sarah will have a son. Then Romans 9, verse 10. Not only this, but also Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of their actions, but because of the one who calls them. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I have hated. Aha! See, then the Calvinist says, I got you. See, he chose Jacob, not Esau. Uh, not exactly. <laughs> you kind of missed the point here. Go back. Genesis 25. 
Genesis 25, verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived another barren wife and another miraculous intervention to bear a child. Now, this child is the one through whom it's going to be counted. The children struggle together within her. Genesis 25 records, and she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? As in, if this is a blessing from God, why is there all this trouble in my, in my womb? She went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. Peoples means nations. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older will serve the younger. That's what God said while they were still in the womb. Isaac and Esau, or I'm sorry, Jacob and Esau. They're still inside the womb. They're fighting in the womb. It's a sign. She goes to God and says, what is this? And he said, it's two nations. They'll be divided from one another. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. Oh, okay. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in the womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, which is why they called him Red, <laughs> or Esau in Hebrew. Edom actually is, is red. Esau is a different word, but still. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, which is uh, Jacob is a snatcher, somebody who grabs, who grasps the heel, which is a, a, a prankster, a joker, a, a trickster is what it means. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. All right, so the firstborn is Esau. The, the, the secondborn is Jacob. The firstborn, Esau, is red, has red hair all over him. Red is Edom. The Edomites, they're Esau's children. Jacob uh, becomes Israel and his sons, the, tri the tribes of Israel. So Edom and Israel. And you recall that they did have interactions with one another in the Exodus, in the wanderings, after they had settled in the land. You remember all these things. And the record of Obadiah stands as a testament against Edom, and the Edomites. All right, so Rebecca has conceived miraculously. She's got twins. They're fighting as a sign. And she asked God, what does it mean? He says, there are two nations. One is stronger than the other. The older serves the younger. The older one is Esau. The younger one is Jacob. And Romans 9, 13 said, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. When did God say that? Did he tell Rebekah that when the children were in the womb? No. That's not, it's not in Genesis 25. Did he tell Moses that when Israel left Egypt? No, it's not in Exodus, not in Numbers, not in Deuteronomy. Which of the kings did he say this to? Nope, it's not in, it's not in Kings, it's not in the Chronicles either. Where is it? It's Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how? The Lord says, isn't Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste Esau's hill country and left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but will rebuild, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I'll tear down. They'll be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eye will see this, and you will say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Malachi 1, he said, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. When did he say this? Centuries later. About whom did he say this? The children in the womb of Rebekah? No. Not about the individual or the men that they grew up to be? No. The nation of Israel and the nation of Edom. He said to Israel, I have loved you. They said, how? He said, isn't Esau Jacob's brother? What does that mean? Well, it means look at what happened to Edom. 
you're still here. Esau, I have hated. Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I've hated. I've laid waste Esau's hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. That's Edom. Edom says, we're shattered, but we'll rebuild. The Lord says, they may build, but I'll tear down. So what is Romans 9 saying? That, that Jacob is saved and Esau is condemned before they're even born? Before they've done anything? No, it's not talking about that at all. It's talking about the nations of Israel and Edom. And yes, that is true. Before these were born, before they'd done anything, God had already decided it was going to come through Israel, not through Edom. And that was fulfilled in Malachi 1, when Malachi can look back, if you will, can say, in retrospect, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. You all think I don't love you because I'm mad about the way you're doing offerings. But look what happened to Edom. That's what happens when I'm mad at you. <laughs> That's what Malachi is saying. So what Romans is saying is not that Jacob was chosen by God to be saved without his obedience, without his knowledge, before he was even born. That's not what it says at all. That's what people think, and that's what people teach. But that is false. Romans 9 is saying the nation was chosen. Continue Romans 9, 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. He says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. It depends then, not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now you see what's happening. This to me is the most egregious example. Okay, Romans 9, 14 to 17. I said earlier in the opening um, comments or statements about this lesson that the Calvinistic reading, you know, reading Romans 9 as if it's talking about salvation, turns God into a monster. These are the verses I'm talking about. What kind of monster chooses to show mercy on some and destruction on others without any human will or exertion. It has nothing to do with you. God has just chosen you to go to hell. You were, In fact, you were created for the purpose of going to hell. What kind of monster do you think God is? That's ridiculous. No, that's not what it says. That's what people believe, though. I'm telling you, go back and read. Well, don't, but you know what I'm saying. You can go back and read the Puritan authors and how they very much wondered whether they were the saved or not. They spent their life wondering. They tried to live right because they thought the ability to live right was might be a good indication that you were among the saved. But there's no guarantee. They really thought that. And people still believe this. Okay, but it's not what the scripture teaches at all. What he's saying is, <laughs> is there injustice on God's part because he chose one nation over another? By no means. He tells Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Meaning it's up to God to decide what nation he's going to use to bring the promise about. It's up to God to decide what nation um, will, will have a fate that serves the purpose of being recorded in the Bible or something or other. Those are all within his purview. He does that on his own. It doesn't matter you know, what we think about it or what we want to do about it. Those things are in motion, and they are what they are. You're not going to change them. The Scripture tells Pharaoh, for this reason I've raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Well, yes, he's raised up to see... Um, you know, the reason why this one has power, the reason why this one has authority, why this one has a great kingdom and wealth 
you know, even though I'm sure he believed it was because he deserved it, <laughs> as most of those people do. Uh, the fact is, the reason why is because God chose to do that so that he could tear that one down and show his glory is with Israel, not with the greatest kingdom on earth, Egypt, at the time. Is it wrong for God to build up a nation and build up wealth and power and influence just to take it away? No, it's not. You and I have no promises about earthly blessings, about things going well for us on, in the world if we do right for God. No, you have no promise about that. In fact, you have several warnings that if you live right, people will persecute you. Things may go badly. Um, no, we don't have that. And it's not unjust for God to make those decisions. And as Job said, we accept blessings from God. Shall we not accept adversity? True. He has his reasons. He has his purposes. We glorify God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. So this Pharaoh was raised up and made powerful just so that his power could be shattered and it could become an example for the world. Now, what does that have to do with Pharaoh's eternal soul and salvation in heaven or in hell? Nothing. That ain't got nothing to do with it. It's talking about the nation of Egypt. Our nation will, has been rising, and, and perhaps our nation would fall. I don't know. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But whether it rises or whether it falls is irrelevant to our salvation. Even if one of us is the president of the United States, that doesn't have anything to do with whether that person is saved. If things go well or if things go poorly. So that's Romans 9, 14 to 17, is talking about something else entirely. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. That's Exodus 33. And I will have you turn to Exodus 33 to understand this. This is the first, uh, one of the most important things, I think. This happened in, you know, Exodus 33. The quote is from verses 18 to 20 where Moses said, show me your glory, please. And the Lord said, I'll make my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. All right. So he said, I will show grace. I will show mercy on whom I will show grace and I will show mercy. So Moses is allowed to see his, his some measure of his glory. That's a that's in God's purview. He's not saying, you know, Moses didn't say, God, please take me to heaven. And he said, Okay, I'll take you to heaven, but I'm sending the rest of the nation to hell. That's it's not talking about that. It's talking about his glory. Now, if you look at the envelope structure, it starts back there in verses one through four. The Lord told Moses, you know, depart from here, go up. Um to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to your offspring, I'll give it. I will send a messenger before you to drive out Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. Go to the land flowing with milk and honey, but, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you're a stiff-necked people. That's Exodus 33, 3, in verse 4, when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. It's disastrous. The Lord said, I'm not going to go with you, because I would have to kill you. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Sometimes you say, I can understand that. <laughs> now we are stiff-necked. But he said, I'm not going to go with you. So later, in 33, verse 15, Moses said to the Lord, If your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. How will it be known? I have found favor in your sight, I and your people. Isn't it in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing you have spoken I will do because you found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. 
And so you go to 34, verse 1, the Lord told Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning. Come up in the morning to Mount Sinai. Present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. Which he did. You see, verse 8, Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped and said, If now I found favor in your sight, Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. It's the second set of tablets. They're starting over. The Lord said, I'm not going to go with you because I'd have to kill you. And Moses said, no, but we are known by your name. We are your people. We're distinct from the world. And so now he says, I will go with you on the basis of making a second copy of the tablets. What are we doing? Well, we're starting over again. The Lord said to Moses, this thing you have done, I, or this thing you've spoken, I will do, remember? Now he says, Moses says in verse 8 of Exodus 34, if I found favor in your sight, let the Lord go in the midst. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And he said, behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people, I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. It is an awesome thing I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, etc. But remember, at first he said, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send an angel to do it, because if I had to be among you, I'd have to kill you. Now he says, I will go with you, and I will drive them out. That's what this whole thing's about. <laughs> so you go back, you know, as he said at, at um, uh, 28 there, the Lord said to Moses, 27, 28, the Lord said to Moses, write these words. In accordance with these words, I've made a covenant with you in Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days, 40 nights. He ate no bread. He drank no water and wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> they started over. And the one who is the mediator for the people has spent 40 days in the wilderness eating nothing, drinking nothing. Hmm. Hmm. But this is the envelope structure. Will God go with them or not? The answer is yes, God will go with them. That's why, that's why Romans 9 said, he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, compassion on whom I have compassion. When did he say that? When Moses said, please show me your glory. Let me be the mediator for this people. And he, he did it. And now he's going to go with them where he wasn't going to go before. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. That's why he said what he did. The Lord chose this people and went forward with this people in that way. The quote about, I will show mercy to whom I have mercy, uh, uh, to whom I will show mercy. You know, this is not about Moses. I'm going to save you because I've chosen to do so. And you don't get to judge me about my choices. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying Moses is setting up as a mediator on behalf of the people is exactly how we're going to do this. And we're starting again, a new covenant. Only this time I will go and I will drive them out. And Moses has inaugurated this with fasting and dedication. And, as he said, for this purpose I've raised you up, says the scripture to Pharaoh, that I might show my power in you. Um, that's Exodus 9, 13 to 17. The Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, ride, uh, present yourself before Pharaoh, Say to him, thus says the Lord, God of the Hebrews, let my people go, that they may serve me. There have already been several plagues at this point. 
But now, he said, this time I will send all my plagues on your person, your servants, your people, so that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. By now, I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. So he's not saying to Pharaoh, I raised you up just to send you to hell. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, Pharaoh, <laughs> I could have killed you a long time ago. I didn't raise you to kill you. I raised you to get glory from the kingdom that is being tumbled or uh, toppled by this humble nation Israel. That's the meaning of Romans 9. Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. No. When we say by no means, we don't mean, oh, no, no, no. His, you know, capricious, <laughs> arbitrary choices about people's salvation are completely just. No, that's not what he's saying. God doesn't make those kinds of choices. He's not that kind of God. He's no monster. He's saying, no, no, no. He's not doing anything wrong. This is about nations, nation states. Who is chosen? And what are they chosen for? All right. I'm going to put an end to it right there and come back to this at another time. So we'll have to pick up Romans 9 at about verse 18 at the next opportunity as we continue Romans 9, um, because there's more to talk about. Quite a bit more to talk about. <laughs> But as we said before, this is one of the most misunderstood passages, and I think it's the most egregious of them insofar as it really makes God into a monster if you read this the wrong way. I think that the Calvinist God is a monster God. I'll just put it out there. I understand that they really believe in him, and they think that I should be struck by lightning for saying it, but no, that's a monster. That's not the real God. The real God is just. The real God is merciful and compassionate, and he does respond to people's individual desires to serve him. As Peter himself would say, for example, in Acts 10, I perceive that in every nation, whoever fears him is heard. So today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian, a child of God, that you might be saved from your sins, that God may bring times of refreshing for you as you are brought back into the fold Today, are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent, make things right with God that we might uh, help you. We will pray for you if, if we can be an encouragement to you. Today is the day of salvation. The things that Romans are telling us is that God works it all out for the good. He wants us all to be saved, yes, and he has been working in history and among the nations to bring about that salvation for us, yes. But don't think that he is some kind of capricious monster. He he really wants your well-being. And anybody who repents, anybody who desires to live right and obeys him can obtain forgiveness. That's why Jesus went to the cross. If we can help you with our prayers, we can help you to be baptized. Let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing. <laughs>